As you know, the current supervisor, Mike Guinness, of course, is uh, retiring. We'll be stepping down at the end of this year. So we've got to fill that chair with uh, someone else. So today we're having our forum. By the way, our forum is sponsored by CTL. That's Consolidated Testing Laboratories of Exeter as well as Porterville. So I want to thank them very much for being a part of the program today. Joining us today is former mayor and former council member of the Porterville City Council, Virginia Garola. And also joining us is Dennis Townsend, who is the um, president of the Townsend Architectural Group. How did I do, Dennis? Did I do that? That was okay? good. I liked All it. All right. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and today's forum, of course, the rules are pretty simple. I'm going to ask questions, and you'll both have a chance to answer both of them. And uh, or both of the questions will be answered by both of you. And uh, we should have a pretty good time. We've got a lot of things to cover. So I think with all of that being said, I'd like to start with... Actually, I wanted to start with the uh, giant Sequoia National Monument, if that's all right. Trail of 100 Giants and all of that. How would you promote that as a visitor destination? I mean, could you get behind that and promote it for District 5? Virginia, if it's all right, Dennis, we'll start with Virginia Garola. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity uh, for KTIP and all the listeners out there. Um, great opportunity to bring tourism. Uh, currently serving on the South uh, County uh, Tourism Committee, and that is comprised of different partners from within the area. And what we're working on is bringing tourism to the area, primarily to the Trail of 100 Giants. Um, and what we're using for the vehicle to do that is the 190, Highway 190. What we've done is we've dubbed that Mighty 190, and I just love that name. Mighty. But Mighty 190 will have the gateway up to the Trail of 100 Giants, but not just that. It will also provide an opportunity to spin off from that to different sites that are available for sightseeing, for tourism, for bicycling, for fishing, for uh, just a numerous amount of things that are happening here that half the time we don't even know about. So yes, I'm very supportive of tourism. All right, very good. And Mr. Townsend, what do you think? Yeah, it, exactly. It's a it's a wonderful resource that we have right here uh, in our backyard. And I, I joke with my wife a lot because we live in Springville. And so anytime somebody walks through Springville or comes into a restaurant that we don't know, she's right on them. And a lot of times they're German tourists. Uh, the other night, probably two weeks ago, uh, there were some Italian uh, there was an Italian couple and their son. Actually, they were living in in Brussels, Belgium, and uh, we had a chance to talk to them. And guess what? That's what that's where they were going. They were going up to the to the Trail of a Hundred Giants. And so we got to pull out a map and and pull it out on the phone and tell them how to get there. And they were uh, they were really excited about it. Their son especially wanted to see it. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, people don't understand what we have up there. People haven't seen trees this size before. So we should take advantage of everything that you know. The Tourism Council, the the Film Commission has been really promoting uh, the use up there uh, of the area. They've done several um, uh, several ads for for TV up there, and also um, they've done a couple of movies up in the area, uh, which is great. They've used some backdrops, so I think we continue uh, to promote that. Uh, continue to reach out through the through the web and social media, and uh, and of course radio. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> to people and invite them in because it is All a great right. resource. Absolutely, thank, thank you, sir. All right, let's, uh, let's move down here a bit on the approach to economic development for the fifth district. There's got to be some things that I'm sure that both of you have a uh, an idea or two on. And uh, Mr. Townsend, maybe we'll start with you this time. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. We really need to begin to reach out. We several years ago, the county uh, board of supervisors they they began to say that Tulare County is open for business. That became sort of the uh, sort of the motto, and uh, I completely agree with that. And what I would want to do is to uh, expand on that to say that let's really look at what we can do to be open for business. The resource management agency, um, I had the experience just the other day of, of walking over with a client, taking some plans up to the counter. And I will tell you that in the past few years, there has been a change there and the change has been for the better. They really were, every person from the lady that we checked in at the counter with, uh, to the plan checker that came up uh, to the next counter, uh, to the person as they were telling us goodbye as we left, they were very, very well 
welcoming. I would like to, uh, to really see that continue. Um, and then to, to really demonstrate that we're open for business, even to have some potentially to have some uh, tax incentives similar, similar to uh, federal and state tax incentives uh, to bring people in and to be very welcoming for business. And then just to show them the way. Here's what we have open. Here's, here's the pieces of property that are open. Here's how we stay out of our prime ag land and, and go up to other areas that are available and just give them uh, some direction and incentivize them and then continue to be courteous and welcoming as they come in. All right. Well, Ms. Garola, what do you think about economic development for District 5? Well, economic development is very important for District 5. Um, without that, we don't have the jobs that are currently in existence, nor can we attract new jobs. Um, I would do what we've done in uh, the city of Porterville and in other cities as well, is you want your industrial sites um, available on the web so that individuals who are outside of our area will know where to go and what types of uh, industry we have available that they could uh, set up at. We'd also want them to meet with other individuals or other companies that are in our area and let them know what the process is like and how we've been able to assist them in getting uh, set up in a business. Um, I believe that attracting businesses also requires one other thing, and that is missing in Tulare County, and that's higher education other than COS or Porterville College, which do a fabulous job. But we need to be looking at a university here. When a business comes to look at a community, and I know this as a city council member, what they do is they're looking at the income, what's the level of income, what's the expendable income uh, for retailers, and then they're looking at for industry, the level of education. What level of education do you have? We have very little BAs or limited BAs, but we also ha do not have master's degrees nor doctoral degrees. And so we need to bring in a university that will help us attract higher or businesses that will have higher paying jobs. So I'd really want to work on that in collaboration with other agencies as well. But I believe what's important is that we all work together. It's not just the county, but it's the cities and all the other communities within the area that we work to say, hey, we're here and as Dennis says, we are open up for business, but we want to work with you. And so we want to attract those businesses that pay a livable wage as well, so that our individuals know that when they get paid, you know what, we're going to be able to take care of our families. So I would certainly work at the process in terms of the permitting process and work in terms of social media as well. I know that COS, uh, not COS, but Porterville, well, COS too, but Porterville College has worked closely like with other universities, National University, that type, that type of yes. thing. COS is working with Fresno State, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about having a, a university here such as UC Merced, that type of thing, or even um, a state college? CSU, state college. CSU, yeah, okay. CSU, Bakersfield, college, or Bakersfield State, Fresno State. We need to start um, stepping up now and providing a program, looking at the programs and which one would be more attractive for this area and then bringing in that. Could it be in the ag area technology, perhaps? So it would really uh, require us to sit down and decide what can we do, how can we bring that, and they're always small steps. They don't happen overnight, and I know as a council member, it can take years, but we can get it done. Thank you very much. And Mr. Townsend, what do you think, what would it take to bring a, a university here? I always thought it had to do with the fact that um, we have one to the south of us and we have one to the uh, north of us. Mm -hmm. uh, what would it really take to bring right. uh, a UC here? Right. Well, we made an attempt um, several years ago. Uh, they were looking at a couple of sites uh, around around town. There were a few limiting factors. One thing that we deal with, um, we haven't talked about it yet today. I'm sure we'll get to it. Is that we're you know off the beaten path because we're off of the the 99. We're over on the 65, and so we're currently in the middle of developing better arterials coming in uh, to the area from the 99 because simply because of access. Um, I think that was one of the limiting factors whenever we were looking looking at a university, um, a UC uh, or a state college here uh, in the past. And the other thing, of course, is water. 
uh, right now we were looking at uh, putting the university sort of um, um, sort of out off of the Fraser Valley area it was one of those uh, areas and there there was no water developed there of course there were no sewer systems there and so limited uh, utilities extensions out there so it would be um, more of a long-term uh, process and I think that these other uh, entities that are coming in and setting up extension programs through the local colleges is sort of one of those first steps uh, toward getting the higher education into the area so again long-term process yeah. Uh, yeah. probably well worth the effort if we would uh, if we if we start down that road gotcha gotcha and we started out with economic development and that to me would flow right into uh the next question would the move of emc from the mountainous area from the reservation uh to the city um are we all in favor of that first of all and number two that would have to be an economic boon for the for the area i would think um virginia what do you think EMC, oh. EMC's move to Porterville. Oh, having uh, Eagle Mountain Casino move to uh, the area closer here into um, Porterville would certainly create additional jobs. Not just that, it creates a safety issue as well because now we have direct access if it were here at near the airport to the Eagle Mountain Casino. And so I believe that that step accomplishes a couple of things. It creates economic development so that people are able to get more jobs, but it also creates another, and that is you're thinking water. Okay, so now we're gonna have water that is gonna be used by Eagle Mountain Casino. When I was on, serving on city council, we were already talking about tertiary treatment plants, especially with East Porterville and the drought that occurred there as the Epic Center. So we were looking at tertiary treatment plants and how we could utilize those in order to reduce the amount of water that was being used, not just by the casino, but through all elements of the city. And that water could then be exchanged with the farmers so that that clean water that is being used by ag could then be switched over to the city and then our water would be moved over, which would be considered um, light brown water because that's the water that you would um, generally get from your showers and mm -hmm. those types mm -hmm. of things. But Eagle Mountain Casino um, will put a positive spin to Porterville because from that we'll get additional growth in business and we're also going to be able to look at water in the way we use water in a different way than we're currently doing so now. Water really is the it's like the the heart of all of it isn't it? You so, can't do yeah. anything without water. <laughs> Mr. Townsend what do you think about EMC moving uh, from the res down here yeah i, I think it's a, an exciting uh, time for them i remember many years ago um they they went around they did their uh, their tour through all the different service clubs they came to our our rotary club the sierra sunrise rotary and made the presentation with a really nice uh, renderings everybody was kind of excited about it and then and then it sort of waned there were there were lots of hoops they had to jump through both at the federal and at the state level uh, and I think they were also just doing um, a lot of work within the community and convincing that it would be a good idea. And they have really done yeoman's work in, in bringing it back uh, to the table now in, in getting their planning done, getting the MOUs started, getting or, or in some of them in place and, uh, and then getting to the, to the federal government jumping through all the hoops they have to jump through there but i uh, i'm excited i think that that they will be able to get this done and when they come down uh you know not only will they have the casino but they'll have the event center that i think will be uh useful for all of the the residents of the area um it's already been mentioned but uh, you know the travel up to the uh, casino and back that's a, that's a pretty windy road uh and a lot of people are really having a hard time with that so there's going to be uh, some some joy that they're going to come be able to to drive right out here uh, okay. just in portable and and utilize it and i think that it will um cause it not only will be good for the casino but i think that other businesses uh, will begin will, will spin off of having the casino uh, out there there will be more need for for restaurants or will be more need for places to stay and other forms of entertainment uh, so i think that it's, it will be a boon for the economy in general of the area that's assuming we have enough water, of course. And if we have the water. <laughs> right back to water once again. Exactly. All right. Well, uh, up next, I wanted to ask you this question because it had been uh, in the news before, over the years. Uh, but 
there's a policy that the county has, and I put this to both of you, of course, that if 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 an elected gets a raise, if the sheriff gets a raise, uh, the assessor gets a raise, county electeds uh, get a raise, that that automatically means because it's policy that the uh, board of supervisors also get an increase, which is I don't know, 25 percent of the total or whatever it was. I'm not quite sure of that, but I do know that they automatically get the raise. Is that a good thing? And would you take the raise? Um, I, does it dictate economic times whether you would take the raise or not? I mean, people, voters, I think, have a, a thing that they say automatically. What, I'm only making this. Why, right. why do they get a raise? Unfortunately, it's just like human nature, I think, right. to do that. So, uh, Mr. Towns, we'll start with you this time on that. Yeah, I've, I've always thought that it was odd that, it's, uh, that the two are tied together. I'm not sure that there's a nexus between uh, the salary of a supervisor or and any of the other salaries, uh, you know, of the 4,900 uh, employees of the county. I, I really don't know why there would be a nexus there. So that could be something that we could look into the history of that, look into the, the legality of why that is. Is there a legal reason? I'm not sure, honestly, but I do think that it's odd. Um, and I think that there should be the flexibility to say, you know, this is the salary for this particular uh, job position. This is the salary for the other and that they're not necessarily uh, tied together. Yeah. I know that a lot of people have said uh, because before – I know that I think it was uh, Amy Shuckley, the current supervisor, who said that she didn't think that this was a good policy either, uh, which I'm assuming that that's what you meant by that. So uh, let me turn to Virginia Garola and ask her that same question. What do you think about the pay raises? Everybody gets one, so you get one too. Absolutely not. Um, having served as a public um, servant, I feel that that policy is one that really needs to uh, be abolished or taken out. Uh, how can you get a pay raise when someone else is getting a pay raise that's an elected official? Um, there, how are you basing that on? I would deny any of those pay raises uh, for the Board of Supervisors and take a look at how you should do it, and that is looking at your statewide um, uh, Board of Supervisors and then look at those that have commonalities between you in our county and then set a pace from that point on but unless the the labor force those that are the backbone to the county are getting a raise i am not taking a raise um, i'm there as a board of supervisor to be a public servant to the constituents of the community and district five and to do a job there and so I don't base that on getting a raise because somebody else has gotten one as well. I also don't think I should be paid for my travels to and from um, the district. That is part of my job as a board of supervisor, and I will not take those. So I'm telling you that I've served as a public official, I've served as a public servant, and I took that um, as a job that I was doing. Um, and you hired me to do a job, I'm going to do that job. Mr. Townsend, is this a full-time job, being a supervisor, is that a full-time gig? It is a full-time job. Uh, yeah, I, I have been uh, on the Tulare County Association of Governments, so I've worked uh, side for seven years now. I've worked side-by-side side, uh, with the five supervisors and with either the mayors or council members uh, from each of the eight cities in the county. And just going to the TCAG meetings once a month and just looking through that uh, agenda, that thick agenda, and doing the research uh, necessary to make those decisions, uh, you understand very quickly um, that serving a, as a county supervisor um, for the 5th District will be a full-time uh, full job. I talked to each of the, uh, the supervisors as well just to ask them, how, how much are you in the office? Uh, how much are, and most of them say, well, you know, we're in the office maybe one to two days a week. But the rest of the time, we're in the district, which makes a lot of sense. You're out there in your own district. Uh, you're not helping anybody a lot of times when you're just sitting behind the desk. So you're out there in the district. You're finding out what the needs are of the people in your district. You're driving over those roads that, you know, that's the first thing they always say when you say you're running. And they say, oh, by the way, when you get elected, this road, and they give you the address, <laughs> that needs to be fixed. There's a yeah. pothole there. So that's the first thing. You need to be out and actually, uh, you know, looking at that. But I, I, know, I know that it is a full-time job. Okay, let me let me move on. Then I'm going to go to the. Um, we live, I, I think, in a severely disadvantaged area. I mean, I, I 
personally think that and I think it's been pretty much proven severely disadvantaged area so what can we do as a supervisor what can you do uh, to help that along I mean we ask these same questions each time we we have these same type of interviews over the years and Ms. Grola we'll start with you what, is there anything that you can do as a supervisor to help these disadvantaged areas we certainly do have disadvantaged uh, area in Tulare County. I think, I, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but the people living in poverty is probably one of the top highest in the state of California. And it hasn't improved any. Um, our family has lived here for over 100 years. We have five generations living here in Porterville. And um, we've been very fortunate that we have been able to obtain jobs or careers that have provided us a, a stable living. But there are individuals who are living here in Porterville, in Tulare County, in District 5, who live from paycheck to paycheck. And it goes back to economic development. We need to have livable wages here. When people don't have livable wages, they've got to start thinking about the things that they can't pay for. Um, what can I pay for? I can't pay for my insurance. I can't pay for my car insurance. I can't pay for my health insurance. So little at a time, people lose those things that we take as um, an advantage or as um, something that we can purchase. I want to I want to tell you a little bit something about what I heard the other day, and maybe this will put some of it into perspective. Um, I, I went to the farm forum, uh, or to the farm bill forum that was held a few weeks back, and I was astonished when I heard this, and maybe I shouldn't have been. But ag does a wonderful job for us. We are number one when it comes to ag. The people that work in ag, and this was at the Farm Bureau, said that the farm workers because they don't get paid that much in 10, 15 years will be the largest population who will be working or only receiving Social Security. And then if you add to that, and this is what I say, if you add to that all the people who are living on livable, on below livable wages, they're all going to be on Social Security. So those of us who have had the jobs, who have given us the careers, who have given us those jobs where we've been able to, to afford a little bit more we're going to be supporting a large population of individuals on Social Security. How are we preparing to serve that population? We Economic development is the key. We have got to attract businesses here that are going to pay livable wages for people so that we, 10, 15 years down the road, we're not seeing that large population who is only on Social Security. And we all know people who are on Social Security, they cannot bear, They can barely make it on that, even with the support services that they receive. So that's really important to me. So you're not saying everybody that, that can't make it, just give them a handout. You're saying no. that economic development will provide... Will provide. Uh, I, don't, uh, I, I don't... Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I don't believe that giving somebody a handout is the way to go. I believe that people want have pride, and they want to be able to make their own way. They're just not able to get those jobs to do that, whether that's because of the skills or the education. So we need to provide them with the education. We need to provide them with career technical education opportunities so that they can get the skills. And then we need to create that uh, force, uh, uh, I'm sorry, labor force that is ready to go, but we need to bring the industry in. So Mr. Townsend, what do you think? I know the question was, uh, what can we do, what would you do as a supervisor to help the severely disadvantaged area that we know is around us? Right, and I think the discussion that we've been having here about the economic development and about bringing businesses in, I think that is the key to the whole thing, uh, that it's not government, you know, it's not, it's not the Board of Supervisors, it's not, it's not the State Assembly, it's not the State Legislature, it's not the, the federal government that creates jobs, it's businesses that, that create jobs. And so when, uh, the more we can be business friendly, the more that we can bring those, those industries in, both ag industries, other industries, and businesses, then we continue to, to create more and more job opportunities you know my uh, uh, a lot of my family came out in the dust bowl whenever those uh, ag opportunities went away because of the drought uh, they came out here uh, my mother and father ended up uh, taking an old furniture warehouse in East Porterville and making a home out of it just with their own hands they, they just built a home uh, 
built a, built it into a home and lived there until uh, the year before I was born when we moved across town and uh, they worked you know my my father uh, was uh, working as a truck driver uh, you know for for Sequoia Rock and in my you know my mother was in packing houses all of my aunts were in the packing houses all of my uncles were following the crops uh, up and down the state and so they were relying on that on that ag income so so ag is of course the biggest uh, the biggest uh, industry that we have uh, in the valley but we also need to then encourage that and then take some spin-offs and encourage those businesses to come in one of the things that we've been doing um, that we can sort of do with education is this career to career and technical education and portable unified calls with the pathways programs i've been working with them for about the past eight years and with trade advisory boards before for that and one of the things they're doing is they're giving the students an idea of what their learning is going to lead them into and so uh, they will show them if you learn these particular skills you could go into engineering if you learn this particular skill you could you could go into the medical field you could go into business you could go into food service and I think those ties that we're creating right now through the school district and we're expanding into the county by the way right now with these programs I think that those ties will help those students um, come back here, know what they can get into, and expect the higher jobs than what they have right now. Expect to do more than, than you know, like I did when I started. I did work as a stock boy, you know, uh, town and country drug. I did then go out and, and, and chop cotton. You know, that's the worst job ever. You go out and pull the weeds out of cotton. Uh, you know, I did those kinds of things and, and, and worked as a gopher, you know, on a framing crew. You do those kind of things as you're getting your education and stepping up to then uh, the possibilities that are offered out there to businesses and or you could even go in and begin your own business in, a, in an entrepreneurial uh, sense and create your own small business and, and start there so i think that's the key to you know that that uh, that rising tide lifts all boats so in, improve the uh, the economics uh, of the area and everyone will benefit by the uh, additional jobs I'm going to ask you a question. When, if you're if you're elected uh, to District Five Supervisor, the business that you're in that's that's a big business. Will it be left in someone else's hands? I mean, is that a fair question? Yeah, I, th I think it really is a fair question. Since you asked me earlier, is this a full time yeah. job? Yeah, you know, that's I mean, something I just that, I, that I have to juggle. We're going to leave our, our business open, uh, and but I am bringing in partners uh, to run the business at this time. The reason we're leaving it open is we have a couple of very nice projects that are on the boards right now that we're right in the middle of. And I want to be able to fulfill uh, those contracts, but we work with other architects and engineers, and so uh, so we've got that uh, we've got that in hand in that eventuality. All right, I don't have to worry about that with you, do I? Sal's going to step in. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a plan to me. Um, you know, we're speaking of uh, you. You're from Springville, uh, Fifth District, Tulare County. And more than one time, that's the reason I bring it up. Uh, I pretty much know the answer, but I'm going to bring it up anyway because people ask me all the time. Um, some people don't believe that there is enough police, or not police, but sheriffs, uh, deputies up in the Springville area or up in the higher, even higher mountain areas. And I know that we have one or two up there, if I'm not mistaken. Could we use more uh, in that Springville area? Virginia, we'll talk with you first on this one. Oh, I, I think we can always use more law enforcement. Um, the, um, the area that the Sheriff's Department has to cover big. Uh, is big. <laughs> it, it, it is big. And when you go up into the mountain areas, including uh, Springville, uh, yes, you do need more law enforcement. And I've gone all the way to um, Ponderosa, to um, Camp Nelson, and one of the things that I heard was, we can't get law enforcement. Well, they come up, but it takes time. Mm -hmm. And that even happens in Terrabella, in Poplar, in any of the communities in our outlining areas. And so I'd like to look at law enforcement in terms of, I know they do mutual uh, response with the city of Porterville, so that's already been worked out. But how can we work at trying to have law enforcement either um, get additional law enforcement officers which is another issue because law enforcement right now, and I don't know if you've heard, in Delano, they've got a commercial going that they're trying to hire. Right now, our law enforcement is very difficult in terms of recruiting because they're having to com com uh, compete with Fresno and Bakersfield who are paying higher. So we need to look at law enforcement 
what are we paying them, what benefits are they receiving, and how do we recruit more law enforcement into the area. And of course, it always comes down to one thing, the budget. <laughs> got to have some money for it. Got to have the money. And, uh, um, and I know that people said that there's really not a whole lot of crime that happens, comparatively speaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know that you live there, so I thought it would be a question for you as well. I mean, if there was a way to have more people up there, we don't want them up there being bored either. But at the <laughs> right. same time, when somebody needs uh, help, um, right. which brings to mind not only that, but how do you get a hold of people if you don't have a phone? Or if you, I mean, there, that, that's a whole new question. We'll get to that later. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, well, I, I want to point out the, uh, the resident deputy program uh, that, that Sheriff Boudreaux has instituted several years ago. is just, it's really a wonderful way to do this. Um, w you know, we know our deputies, uh, you know, on a first name basis. We, and right in Springville, we have Deputy Mike Torres, you know, great guy. And he's just, he's just taking care of business up there. Up the hill, we have Aaron Johnson or AJ, you know, they call them these up the hill in in, uh, in Camp Nelson. They work together. They cover each other's uh, shifts. And uh, I was I've been really impressed um, when we were having all of the uh, uh, the marijuana eradication up there that they actually had the CHP uh, along with the sheriff, along with the Forest Service, and then some federal agents all up there at once. They actually in one case were queuing right on our our road, parking on wow. our on our driveway almost while they were doing this. I'm really impressed with the cooperation. Um, you know, but the the answer is I I really love what's going on now. I serve on the sheriff's uh, personal outreach team or spot uh, team I have for a, a few years now, and uh, we talk about uh, those things. How is it working with these with these resident deputy programs? How are we raising other deputies to come in uh, to their uh, to their communities? And that's what the focus has been is to develop the uh, the the younger ones as they're coming up and wanting to get into the sheriff's department trying to train them within their own communities to come out and be resident deputies in those communities. That helps because you, you don't have the response time. They actually live right there. Yeah. Now, the problem is, of course, is they live right there. And so when did they have time off? There, there has to be some sort of a rotation, and they're doing that by covering each other's uh, uh, sort of beats, you know, right now. So uh, more would be better, obviously, but the ones that are out there are just doing um, a really a great job and need to be continued to, uh, we need to continue to provide them uh, with uh, the equipment that they need, uh, with the finances that they need to continue to expand those programs. Because we're also growing in population. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. But, uh, and, uh, but you have to admit that there are a lot of people that say the same thing over and over again, you know, that it's taken too long for this or too long to get somebody out. It depends on the crime, I suppose. But I do know that the Sheriff's Department has a posse unit. They have the horseback Right. Um, deputies and that type of thing. Yeah. I just uh, uh, so are you telling me that we could use another one up there? Would you would you try to get another one up there if you were a supervisor? You know, I I think I, I think so. Uh, I think as as a backup, as somebody that could that could rotate in. I think it's good to have the one resident deputy for each of the communities. Some communities don't have the resident deputies, and and they have to uh, and one has to cover several communities. And some are at the time where they're uh, you know they're ready to move on, and so that we need to have a replacement there so trying to bring people up that are from sort of those areas to, to step back in but I definitely think it would be something to look at although they're doing a great job I'm sure that they would appreciate uh, having a having a backup time to have somebody else come in for them all right all right I wanted to talk a little bit about it get your feelings on um, kids in the community um, I've, I've often wondered why we couldn't have more programs for I know there's a lot out there and again now I'm going to get calls because I know that there are a lot of people out there but when we hear about news all the time and the sheriff's done a good job on trying to crack down on some of these um, human trafficking situations I think is the word I wanted and not only that but just not just for human trafficking but the kids that get you know thrown into a I don't know that one touches me and I just wonder if there's anything as a supervisor that you, we could maybe perhaps work with uh, the sheriff and come up with, or the city people as well, and come up with things that could help train these kids, get them off to a, a different start, in other words. Because we still see the human trafficking, although they're doing a good job trying to catch them right now. Uh, Ms. Groley, you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, I think you're right in terms of that we have a lot of things for kids to do, but then we also have 
not as much for those kids who probably don't have the access to some of those programs. So let me just start by saying that in the early 80s um, through Porterville College, we did a program that was called the Sixth Grade Partnership. And I led that program. And what we did is we brought all the sixth graders and we went out to career or people from businesses and visited them and told them about the importance of an education. Then we took them out to the college. Those kids, when they went out uh, to the college six years later, came up and says, oh, Ms. Grohl, I remember you. And I says, great. And I believe it was because we were able to educate the kids. Um, and one of the importance here is that not every child, not every student is going to go to college. It's just, just not going to happen. I used to say every kid has to go to college, but now I say not every kid's going to go to college, but they want a skill and they want to be able to do a job. And so CTE is important here. I believe that we need to start getting, I think the pathways are doing that, but we also have students who are dropping out from that uh, pathway. And those are the kids that we need to grab and that we need to get and start working with them by developing a program where we get to speak with them, get people to mentor them, and find out, hey, how can we help you get onto the right path to the right place? When kids go down this path of um, human trafficking, of gangs, of affiliations they really should not be a part of, what it's going to lead them to is right into a courtroom. And once they start down that criminal pathway, it's very difficult to make a change. I believe we can make changes on some, but there are some that we can't, so we need to capture those kids at the early ages. So I would want to look at expanding the Step Up program, for instance, expanding a program where we actually go out and divert those kids who are going to the juvenile as the next step for them. Yeah. And we all know that, you know, there's, uh, as parents, we have to step up, too. I mean, yeah, well, of course. Um, you know, and a lot of times uh, some of the kids don't have those uh, around them like they should. So, no, but let right. me ask you, Mr. Townsend, the same question. Anything that you think of that would, would right. help uh, keep kids off the street, this type of thing? Right. It's sort of an all of the above. It's not a, it's not an either or. It's a both and. and. And I think, Hopper, you put your finger on it. When you, you start off with parents, um, and unfortunately, you know, with, uh, you know, with half of our homes uh, being single parent homes uh, that's that's a big issue and that's where you're seeing uh, some of the children feeling like they don't belong feeling like they don't um, fit in uh, feeling like they don't have that base of values because our our, our family unit um, has deteriorated over time if you look back over the last 50 years uh, you can see a pretty bad deterioration in the in the family unit and uh, of course the problems with uh, children uh, follows right along with that. So we actually worked. Um, uh, we got into sort of sort of sideways. We uh, said, "Yeah, we'll take the uh, church youth group uh, um, for a day for one Sunday." Many years ago, that that led into youth pastoring on a volunteer basis at uh, two different churches uh, for about the next 15 years. And so we were able to see um, kids that were coming out of, of um, you know two parent homes uh, that were doing well. They were bringing them up uh, you know with their values with their faith and and those kids you know did pretty well and you look at other ones that were coming in and they didn't have that base they didn't have those values so other people stepped in you know uh, I mean we as youth pastors uh, showed care and concern and helped to instill some of those values in them other volunteers would come in and do that uh, you know through the church or through just friends and then it and then it, sometimes you also will have those programs like after school programs you know we had the police activities league you know that would come out and do things uh, for a while and and you know you, you also have things like 4-h you have things like scouting you have you know all of the the ag uh, things that the kids can get involved in and that really teaches them some of those values and keeps them from going out and just being bored and and, and sort of acting out as business leaders and and uh, as 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 government officials and as schools, we can really expand on these uh, on these uh, internships and apprenticeships uh, that we're offering through the career technical education uh, pathways programs. And I think that helps to uh, again, you're bringing them, you know, off of what could be the streets after school. You're bringing them into an office environment, uh, and you're showing them uh, what it's like to be a professional, what it's like to have a skill. 
and they're probably going to be more likely then to try to follow that up um, as opposed to going out and just uh, getting into mischief in other places. So yeah, I'm with you. I think it starts with the parents uh, instilling those values. When you don't have it, then you have a bunch of other organizations that can help and step in. Yeah, I just think that, uh, and you, you hit that on the head when you said uh, earlier that not every kid has two parents or even one, some of them, right. and they're hanging out and doing this type of thing. And those are the kids that um, that concern me and concern a lot of folks. You know, how can we help those? And, and by getting them involved in things like Step Up, I thought, you know, we could do more on Step Up. I mean, don't get mad at me, folks, but I think we could do a little more. And, I'd, you know, I'm happy to help, and people are happy to step up sure. and help as far as that goes. But Well, and I think that... Yeah. Um, in this generation now more of the grandparents are taking care of their children <laughs> That's true. Yep. and so <laughs> the grandparents are now going to the games and everything else so yep. it's it, the the family unit has changed somewhat yep. and, um, and 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 it does begin with the parent but or the grandparent <laughs> in some cases many times <laughs> I'm there <laughs> All right. Anyway, let me move on uh, to the uh, Cross Valley Rail Corridor that we've been hearing so much about. Uh, on the surface, it looks like a great thing. I, I don't see a negative to it on the surface. Uh, I know it has to do with money and things like that. TCAG has uh, done a good job with this and, and other people involved as well. As a supervisor, you you continue to support that, or if you support that at all, Mr. Townsend? Yeah, and uh, serving on TCAG, I'm real familiar with it. And, and of course, uh, you know, we've had this discussion, even even at the last TCAG meeting, there was a little joking uh, going on about it as we were talking about it, um, because, it, it you know, it's tying in with uh, with the high, with the high speed uh, rail. And uh, so a lot of people, even if you're on the, the opposite side of the, you don't want the high speed rail to go in. You have to, though, prepare for if it did what are you going to do for this uh, getting somebody from one side of the valley to the other where you might be able to get on the rail if it did come in so the discussion kind of comes down to well even if it if it never goes in if they never finish it it's so far over budget it doesn't get finished you can still have a benefit of the uh, of the cross valley corridor on using on using that sort of a light rail system um, to then have access of people uh, coming from Porterville, you know going all the way to the other side of the valley um, and and being able to do that hopefully at a lower uh, at a lower fare uh, I, my wife and I were able to spend a year in uh, in Florence Italy I took my last year of school there uh, through a uh, study abroad program uh, from Cal Poly and in that you went everywhere on a train because in, in Europe uh, they developed that way they developed along the rails we were a little bit uh, a little bit different uh, here because we you know we're independent and you had you know the somebody come out and they just set up their place out in the middle of nowhere and then somebody else set up another place out in the middle of nowhere so we weren't real connected uh, like that uh, as as we grew so we're not used to it not a lot, uh, not a lot of planning involved uh, <laughs> right right okay. exactly we're very independent yep. so when we kept we're coming in uh, later and saying okay let's find a corridor where we could put a and have an alternative uh, alternative means of transportation and so yeah uh, so we're moving ahead with that and looking at the different uh, options of what uh, what type of rail what type of, uh, of, of car itself that goes on the rail they were they were looking at uh, sort of a diesel one I think that's morphing into probably an electric one mm -hmm. uh, now but I think it would be a good thing I think it would be a valuable resource uh, to have even if even if it's not a connection to high-speed rail I think it'd be a valuable resource to have it Ms. Garola what do you think about that well, I served on TCAG when I was on city council. I served on there actually 12 years. So we started talking about light rail some time ago. And the approach that we were looking at was regional transit, not just the, uh, the uh, light rail, but also in how we were using um, our bus uh, system to be able to capture individuals and bring them into the community. So on the uh, light rail, what, um, which I'm very supportive of, what we did there is the city of Porterville purchased uh, through TCAG eight miles of the old abandoned rails, which goes into Strathmore. And people, a lot of people don't know that that belongs to the city of Porterville. And so in preparation of the um, light rail or cross valley rail that it's called now, that would bring individuals across the valley, but specifically to the high-speed rail when that happens. And I agree, that's already going. We can't take a, a side on that. Um, there's gonna be good there, 
but for the light uh, rail, I am very supportive of that because that is going to be a regional approach that takes people throughout the valley, throughout the district, in a mode of transportation that we've not had before. So very good. Yeah. Now I know that uh, we we spoke about this uh, about a week ago, or um, maybe it was with uh, Ted Smalley even mm. uh, talking about the South Valley. What is it called again? The Cross Valley um, <laughs> Corridor, the one, the piece that definitely would go from uh, Porterville through winding and ending up in Huron. Is that is that correct? Is it Huron? Yeah, Hur I think it's Huron, Huron that I had right. Yeah. So I'm probably throwing out <laughs> information I'm not sure of, but I I believe that's it. And so uh, it sounded really really good, um, and and in provided places for people to, although we didn't discuss the fact that uh, high-speed rail could be involved. So I'm glad that you brought that up because that's mm -hmm. both of you. I mean, if it's going to be there, and we've heard this from everybody from, from Visalia to Hanford, you know, if it's going to be there and there's nothing we can do about it, let's at least try to get a good stop for our people or something, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So I thought I'd ask you about that since yeah. we've been kicking it around quite a bit. Um, as we get close to time, I, I want to ask you both why we should vote for you, um, what your major differences are. Can we start there? What do you, how do you feel you're different than Mr. Townsend? And that's kind of putting you on the spot, but I've been a nice guy for at least 45 <laughs> minutes. So That's your limit to being a nice <laughs> guy. Pretty much. No, no, not really. But I just really would like people to know the differences between you two. Are we voting for the same type of thing? Or uh, are we looking at two different ways of uh, marking that ballot? So, um, Virginia, would you like to start there? Sure. Um, so I see the difference between us is uh, that I have had experience serving on the city council, 12 years on city council. So uh, I know what we need to do when we're looking at planning, when we're looking at industrial, when we're looking at zone changes and all the other things that go along with that. Um, I've also served on the Tulare County Association of Governments, TCAG, as well as the South, uh, San, uh, sorry, San Joaquin Valley Air Board. And so I have experience in there in terms of getting funding out to the various uh, communities so that they can do electric buses and other types of um, functions with the uh, uh, reducing air pollution. Um, so I've worked on several uh, committees, uh, including the mitigation that comes out of TCAG as well, so that we can mitigate before we actually come before a prob problem when a project is going forward. Um, I have experience serving, um, having a career of 37 years at Porterville College, uh, serving students and ensuring that they are moving forward, whether that's to a career, whether that's to their higher education. and. Um, the other is that I have the experience of having lived here all my life in Tulare County, and I know that Dennis has as well, as well. but living here in terms of knowing what it's like to have to deal in a disadvantaged situation, uh, dealing with individuals who, um, including some of us in our family, who have had to struggle to try to make a career out of um, what we have. I'm a first generation college graduate out of our family um, and am leading that pathway for my granddaughters as well. And so um, there's many differences between us, but I would say I would stand on those as the differences that when we start the job as the Board of Supervisor, I'm ready to go in and start that on the first day and to sit down with the um, RMA and all the others and start talking about what business are we going to start doing for not just District 5 for Tulare County to improve us so that we are no longer below that level in the poverty. So does that make you different than this gentleman here? I believe my experience, I believe okay. my, yeah, okay. That's the experience. Fine. That's fine. I just make sure I was on the right I, track. I don't know what else would make me different other yeah. than my experience. No, oh, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Mr. Townsend, your turn. What is there a difference between you and this lady right here? I mean, I'm just asking. <laughs> yeah, we're both wearing blue. As, as that's uh, good. I forgot the memo. <laughs> <because> <laughs> so. I didn't get it or something. So Besides that, yeah. No, you know, uh, one of the reasons that um, 
you know, actually Supervisor Ennis was the first one to, to reach out and, and ask me to run um, for this position. And uh, he did it and several of the others came and uh, kind of slapped me on the back, congratulated me. And several other people at the county level said, what we need is we need someone uh, to come in that has a business mindset. And so they're looking at me as a small business owner, as some people like to say, I've signed both sides of the checks. Uh, so uh, for the past uh, for the past about 18 years, I've run I've run my own business through uh, through the highs and lows of this economy. And you know, in the construction industry, I'm an architect, but this, so we're tied to the construction industry. I mean, I've seen it going where it, it's just going gangbusters with the economy, and then we saw it dry up to nothing. And we've had to deal with budgets uh, that will smooth out those. Uh, those peaks and those valleys and try to stay alive uh, you know many businesses went under during those times we were able to uh, we were able to survive it and and this the business uh, mindset has come actually from uh, it, it goes all the way back to when I was 12 years old I was working in the backyard with my dad he was showing me how to build how to build a shed and uh, uh, he was my stepdad actually my father passed away when I was five but uh, he, he and he had polio and he was in a wheelchair and he's showing me this is how you you know you run a saw this is how you hammer hammer the nails and so he showed me all that and I got excited I said you know what I know what I want to do for the rest of my life I'm going to be a contractor I'm going to build things and that morphed into architecture because of my mom's wisdom saying well you might want to work in an air-conditioned office when you get a little older and so morphed into architecture I stayed with that also became the first one in my family to uh, to attend college and to graduate from college and I have have my, my bachelor's there but went right into building building you know working for people at all different levels and then building a business uh, from the ground up uh, and then staying in, in that business so I can take that along with uh, my knowledge of uh, the different government agencies I've been able to look into all of them I'm working with been working with the sheriff for a few years on spot been working with TCAG now been reelected to the third term on on TCAG by the supervisors and uh, you know I've been able to just in the in that relatively uh, you know short span of years been able to gain enough confidence that I've that I've gained the in endorsements uh, of many of those people the, the, you know the, sh the sheriff I have his endorsement I have the deputy sheriff's association endorsement I have a uh, Roland Hill our assessors endorsement I have uh, three of the supervisors endorsements um, I have the the Tulare County Professional Firefighters Association endorsement police officers research uh, <laughs> you know Association of California endorsement so all of them in that short period of time have said they believe believe in the skills that I'll be able to bring to the table. Oh, all right, very good. All right, at this time, I'm going to give you both a shot real quick because it will be quick, and I, I apologize for that because sometimes I let it roll on. But uh, I want you to look straight into your cameras there right in front of you, and Ms. Garola, we'll start with you uh, on why folks should vote for you. And we've got less than uh, a minute and a minute half and for a half. you <laughs> and you. Okay, thank you. Well, primero, que, primero quiero decir que es muy importante que se pueden registrar para, las, uh, para votar. El 21 de este mes es el primer día, el último día que pueden registrar para votar junio, el, uh, el 5 de junio. Um, I encourage you all to register to vote by May 21st. That is the last day that you can register to vote in the June 5th uh, primary. I just want to say that I can have all the experience. I can do all the right things. I can go out there and work just like I did on city council for you. And I did it without uh, any, any payment for that except the acknowledgement from you, the voters, who said thank you. I come from you, I work next to you, and I will never, ever receive the endorsements than Mr. Townsend has received. All right. Because we are very different people. Mr. Townsend, I've got to jump in and let you do this real quick here. Okay, uh, you know, I have kind of narrowed it down to about five things that are very important. There's there's many more than that, but business, ag, water, public safety, education. Uh, in all of these areas, uh, I've talked to community and county leaders and have been able to gain their confidence uh, that, that I do have a plan and that I do have an open ear uh, for people from all of those sectors. And so I'm looking forward to being their voice. I'm looking forward to being your voice uh, in this district, in this county 
county and even beyond through our connections with the state and federal government. I want to thank, thank you. I want to thank you both for being here. We appreciate it very much. And our thanks to all of our people, including CTL Consolidated Testing Laboratories. Kyle, thank you very much for producing this thing. And thank you at home for checking it out, watching us and listening to us right here on News First. Thank you very much and have a great evening.